And now at half past nine, Kaleidoscope. Tonight, Paul Bailey introduces a critical survey of American literature and drama, a declaration of independence. Good evening. Tonight's special edition of Kaleidoscope traces, somewhat kaleidoscopically, the development of fiction and drama in America. Regrettably, we've had to concern ourselves with a few themes and even fewer writers. Edgar Allan Poe, Edith Wharton, Kurt Vonnegut and John Updike are just some of the names that won't be mentioned. To apologise for these omissions, however, is to suggest something of the diversity and richness of the best American writing. Appropriately, we're starting with an extract from what is arguably the greatest work of imaginative literature to come out of the New World, Herman Melville's Moby Dick. When, at last, his mind seemed made up touching the character of his bedfellow, and he became, as it were, reconciled to the fact, he jumped out upon the floor, and by certain signs and sounds gave me to understand that, if it pleased me, he would dress first and then leave me to dress afterwards, leaving the whole apartment to myself. Thinks I, Queequeg, under the circumstances, this is a very civilized overture. But, the truth is, these savages have an innate sense of delicacy, say what you will. It is marvelous how essentially polite they are. I pay this particular compliment to Queequeg because he treated me with so much civility and consideration while I was guilty of great rudeness, staring at him from the bed and watching all his toilet motions. For the time, my curiosity getting the better of my breeding. Nevertheless, a man like Queequeg you don't see every day. He and his ways are well worth unusual regarding. A scene from Moby Dick, read by Bruce Myers. Earlier this week, I talked about the importance of American fiction, past and present, with Malcolm Bradbury, Professor of American Studies at the University of East Anglia, and Dr. Tony Tanner of King's College, Cambridge, whose book, City of Words, an examination of mid-20th century American fiction, has just been reissued. To begin with, I invited Tony Tanner to explain what significance the very European notion of the noble savage, and savages don't come more noble than Queequeg, had in early American literature. This has a um, particularly significant importance for the 19th century writers who began to write about America because, of course, America was simply founded on genocide. And uh, they had to get rid of the Indians, or at least thought they had, so they could settle. So you get this absolute root ambivalence towards the Indian from the beginning, a tendency almost to suppress memory of him, but he keeps coming back in, in, in one or two ways. Uh, I'll mention these very briefly. Fenimore Cooper, in his novels you have absolute ambiguity about the Indian. He's either the lowest savage and civilization must replace him, or he is the most noble product of nature and civilization is accruing guilt to itself by destroying him. Or he turns up again in Moby Dick in the figure of Queequeg as somebody full of sort of warmth, a uh, simple kind of uh, loving, instinctive rapport, both with nature and, of course, with Ishmael, as opposed to the white sort of Puritan destructive egomania of Ahab. And I could trace this right on, but the recent poet, William Carlos Williams, he elevated the figure of the Indian as the way of being in America. And he finishes uh, one chapter by saying, doesn't it make you want to lift dead Indians from the ground to steal some authenticity from the land? And that's really how the, the figure of the Indian has returned as representing a kind of authenticity and a, an authentic intimacy, not an aggressive intrusion in the American landscape. So he's still very much there, but at the level of imagination. And, and what this means, I think, is that there is a massive instinct in um, American fiction, American poetry, towards mythology, towards the whole process of creating a system of myths and associations that is a definition of American culture. I think this is one of the striking things about American culture, American writing, American painting too, the degree to which it does attempt to mythologize American society and the ideals, the myths that live through it, rather than dealing with details of social life or mm. details of manners, and um, one of the fascinating things is in the 19th century is to see the American novels struggling with this process. So on the one hand, you have Cooper fascinated with the world of the settlement and civilization, 
and uh, coming to Europe, uh, living in France, examining manners with great care, writing social fictions. On the other hand, pushing his imagination through into the forest, the frontier, the prairie, and uh, trying, in, in Cooper's case, in, in, in an extremely simple way as far as the myth is concerned, but in an extremely complicated way as far as the relationship of the myth to the society is concerned, or, um, to construct what really is a new kind of historical fiction. It could be said that American writers fall into two categories, the immigrants and the emigres, the ones who came and stayed, the ones who were born there but felt stifled to such an extent that they fled to Europe. Malcolm Bradbury discusses the immigrants first. I think you have a great tradition in American writing of trying to avoid being European, a nativist tradition, in some ways, perhaps even a provincial tradition. And then at the same time, you have a constant uh, pressure towards cosmopolitanism that is, I think is absolutely key to an understanding of American literature and one of its basic temptations to most of us. Mm. Somehow it's a massive reflector of the movements of Europe as well as of its own native energies. And um, I think uh, it's this sort of process that uh, helps explain why Mark Twain and Henry James can coexist at roughly the same yes. time. Yeah. A writer writing about the West in a vernacular tradition, a writer writing about Europe in such a way as he said that he couldn't be told from a European writer. And uh, it's this uh, mixture of the two systems, the two forces, mm -hmm. I think, has always been crucial to American literature. And it gets mixed in all sorts of new ways mm -hmm. at various points in American writing. One of them, I think, is the influx of immigrants in the later 19th century who begin to write up their experience so that you could begin to establish a Russianized Jewish tradition in American writing. In the 20th century, I think it's fed by an extraordinary pressure on the part of American writers to avoid writing like Englishmen, and therefore start writing like Europeans. And uh, the great expatriate flight to Paris in the 1920s is, I think, a very good example of mm. American writers feeling a compulsion towards exile, a compulsion to get away from what they saw as the limitations of Puritanism, the provincialism of American society, but not to do become you, English. Do you think that Henry James detected those particular things? Yes, I think James is the classic reflector of all this, the kind of writer who, having looked back on his own tradition, looked back on Hawthorne, looked back on Cooper, decided that there was very little going on, that it was hard for art to put its roots down in American soil, and therefore took the path of cosmopolitanism as a positive step towards associating American culture, which he believed to be somehow bereft, mm. uh, with European culture. But it still seems an extraordinary judgment from, well, from this time now, that uh, he did take that step, that he turned his back on all this vast wealth of material, and to become, well, he was very much his own man. Nobody else writes like Henry James, but he did become a very European writer, didn't he? Yes, he did. I think he didn't think there was a vast wealth of material in America. In fact, he uses all kinds of uh, metaphors of thinness and aridity and uh, everything being rather attenuated there, even the light's rather poor and sort of <laughs> young and juvenile, that's his word for it. It seems to me that one of the things we're talking about here is the international balance of cultural power and the way in which America, on the whole in the 19th century, is a place you go away from and come to Europe to avoid what is missing in the United States. Yes. That's to say, you come to Europe for culture. And in the 20th century, when the balance of power seems to me totally to reverse itself, and uh, increasingly it is the westward journey that becomes important for the European writer. I think that um, Nabokov, Auden, I mean, one can mm. think actually of quite a lot of names, yes, sure. is a very interesting story of the Jamesian pilgrimage in reverse. Yes. Um, Christopher Isherwood remarked about Lolita once that it was the best guidebook to America that he'd ever read. And it sounds a rather eccentric judgment. Could you say something about why he made that statement? Yes, it's, it's, it's a marvelous example, I think, of the attempt to define America through a language which is not quite American. Uh, Nabokov calls it his love affair with the English language. And um, the fascinating part of the story, I think, is this extraordinary mixture of a Russian symbolist sensibility and an American vulgarity, which nonetheless needs to be written through, written out, and understood, and indeed fornicated with, <laughs> made love to, which, uh, of course, is, is, is why Lolita is, uh, in a sense, the guidebook to America, like the girl herself. But along with that is a marvelous uh, documentation of the motels, the old trek across the Middle West of America, and uh, the way in which the chase across America becomes, in fact, the ultimate task of the language maker. 
Farewell, Appalachia. Leaving it, we crossed Ohio, the three states beginning with I and Nebraska. Ah, that first whiff of the West. Again, we were welcomed to weary motels by means of inscriptions that read, We wish you to feel at home while here. All equipment was carefully checked upon your arrival. Your license number is on record here. Use hot water sparingly. We reserve the right to eject without notice any objectionable person. Do not throw waste material of any kind in the toilet bowl. Thank you. Call again the management. P.S. We consider our guests the finest people of the world. I think it should be said there is a slight difference here that some of those first writers, including Nabokov, uh, it wasn't a voluntary pilgrimage. Mm. It was getting away from Hitler's Europe, so exactly. it was flight. Yes. And that means a different kind of ambiguity towards the country you go to. It's a, a host country. It's protecting you. So that puts you in a special position when you're trying to assess its values and as well its limitations. What do you think uh, drew Scott Fitzgerald to Paris? Well, he went to Paris as a playboy, in fact, but um, I think one of the most remarkable works of the 20th century is, in fact, the story that comes out of that experience, Tender as the Night, which uh, I believe to be a remarkable and much misunderstood novel, which is about a young man called Dick Diver, who actually dives headlong into the chaos of 20th century European history, particularly 20th century European psychic history, it's a wonderful trek around the sanatoria and the uh, psychiatric clinics of uh, Switzerland and other parts of Europe, as well as being a celebration of that rather depraved socialite milieu that spread along the Cap d'Antibes in the south of France, mm. uh, and which uh, Fitzgerald was a very guilty member of. And I think that he manages to sum up all the contradictions of that experience marvellously in Tender is the Night. The visit to America is immediately struck by the sheer size of the place. Something of this vastness is reflected in American writing. There is a sense of spaciousness in both the best and the worst of it. Tony Tanner commented on this important aspect of American literature. Well, I think there's an ambiguous attitude to space is there from the beginning because in one sense it's a positive thing because it's room to expand in. But then uh, it also becomes a very uh, diminishing thing. It trivializes a man. It makes him feel very isolated and uh, just like a little atom. And you get a kind of recoil from space. And the movement westward is by no means a sort of uh, unbroken and unilinear. There's often a return from the open spaces back to the settlement because it's too frightening out there. Yeah. Even in Cooper you get this. And one of the extraordinary things, I think, about American contemporary literature is that it reports massively on the urban experience. It's a, a literature of the city. It's a literature of the, of, of the complex yes. city, the technological city. Yeah. And um, some of the greatest American writers, I think, have appealed to us, have meaning for us now, precisely because they are using the urban space-time continuum, the um, presence of a massive, oppressive technology, a world in which all sorts of potentials for romantic feeling have been drained away. And then there is the attempt very often to reconstitute these. And so the urban-rural contrast, or the relationship between city space and landscape space, as it were, is, is a key relationship in American writing. Yes. yes, and in fact Hemingway and Faulkner would be the last two major writers who still tried to make something out of the possibilities of, of, of rural space and the kind of regenerative possibilities. And that seems to have gone out as one term of the dialectic. It's urban now. Now, Saul Bellow, I suppose, is the most famous example of a writer completely obsessed with the idea of city life. Yes, and I think this is why he rose to eminence after the war. He's the first writer really to displace the uh, hegemony which had been exercised by Faulkner and uh, Hemingway, who, as it were, are the last great wasp writers. And he did so because his experience as a sort of Jewish immigrant intellectual seemed to fit very much more closely to the experience of the majority of Americans after the war, for whom experience was predominantly urban. He did not know these new sections of Chicago. Clumsy, stinking, tender Chicago, dumped on its ancient lake bottom. And this murky orange west, and the hoarseness of factories and trains spilling gases and soot on the newborn summer. Traffic was heavy coming from the city, 
Matt on Herzog's side of the road, and he held the right lane, looking for familiar street names. After Howard Street, he was in the city proper and knew his way. Leaving the expressway at Montrose, he turned east and drove to his late father's house, a small two-story brick building, one of a row built from a single blueprint. The pitched roof, the cement staircase inset on the right side, the window boxes the length of the front room windows, the lawn a fat mound of grass between the sidewalk and the foundation. Along the curb, elms and those shabby cottonwoods with blackened, dusty, wrinkled bark and leaves that turned very tough by midsummer. A quotation from Herzog by Saul Bellow. At this point, let's turn our attention to drama. In England, for many years, it's become a cliché to regard Eugene O'Neill as the only American dramatist of world stature. I asked Brendan Gill, theatre critic of The New Yorker, if he could suggest any other names. Well, I certainly feel very strongly that Tennessee Williams uh, is a dramatist of world stature. O'Neill, unquestionably, uh, has a kind of tragic grandeur that inclines us because we seem to respect tragedy perhaps even more than it deserves, causes us to put him at the head of the list. But Tennessee Williams is in many ways a much more remarkable playwright than O'Neill, and the variety of his work is so much greater than that of O'Neill that I count upon him to last. I think one of the good things uh, that's happened uh, with Tennessee Williams in this period of our bicentennial is that we have brought back so many of his plays, and the productions of these plays have proven more successful in almost every instance than the original production of the play, Streetcar Named Desire or Sweet Bird of Youth or uh, The Glass Menagerie. I would certainly put Williams and, and O'Neill at the top of the tree. Two of the criticisms leveled at Tennessee Williams' work have been its decadence and its feeling of taking place in the hothouse. Do you think these are accurate criticisms of his work? No, Mr. Bailey, I think that those criticisms of Tennessee Williams were made in the early days when the plays were first coming out, and I think people were astonished at uh, his Baroque imagination, of his Southern Gothic uh, imagination. The fact is that he was taking certain traditional forms of, uh, of, of melodrama, including the Gothic, and making use of them for his purposes. We think of him as a Southern playwright. In point of fact, he was born in St. Louis, Missouri, which is one of the big Middle Western cities of America, and feels very little Southern indeed, and has very little that we would think of offhand as either decadent or hothouse in it. But Williams had other fish to fry. He was interested in getting at certain things that he believed about himself and about the people whom he knew, and he used the framework of the, the extreme pretend decadence of the American South and of the steaming bayou of Louisiana and, and Mississippi. These were devices. He was really, in effect, playing with us when he played with them. And now, I think, we see that he was making use of a form for his purposes and inside which he could tell the truth as he saw it uh, about his own emotions. Arthur Miller's social plays were highly praised when they first appeared. Nowadays, they tend to be dismissed as being sentimental or loaded. I'm thinking particularly of Mary McCarthy's criticism of their hollow universality. Would you go along with her rather harsh judgment? Yes, I suspect I would. I don't think I have ever have the nerve to be as, as uh, cruel, or maybe I'm not as clever enough to be as cruel as Mary McCarthy, but hollow universality, I think, is a very fair judgment of Arthur Miller. Uh, he's an old-fashioned playwright. He's, a, he's an Ibsenite playwright. He does his best to think hard and uh, comes up with a subject and then marches straight at that subject and deals with it in as nearly a well-made play as he can. But the content of that play, to the degree to which it is a problem, to the degree to which he has faced it as a fact out there uh, that he is going to wrestle with, is the degree to which I think he falsifies uh, emotions in himself. Interestingly enough, in a double bill that is now playing in New York in a play called A Memory of Two Mondays, a play that uh, Arthur Miller wrote 20 years ago, but which was laid in the early 1930s when he was a young man, is very uh, attractive simply because it comes as close as any of his plays to giving us that 
pleasing young Miller, that, that nice young man before he began uh, to be a thinker, uh, before he began to be Lincoln-esque. He became, I think, too soon a public figure. He became a kind of um, man of letters, which is a very rare thing in America. We don't have men of letters, and I think he felt the responsibility of the toga of the man of letters as a very heavy one. Here, perhaps to demonstrate what Brendan Gill means, is a scene from Arthur Miller's most famous play, Death of a Salesman. Biff is telling his father, Willie Lohman, the salesman of the title, a few family truths. You know, I had no address for three months. I stole a suit in Kansas City and I was in jail. No, Stop not... crying, I'm through it. I suppose that's my fault. And I stole myself out of every good job since high school. And whose fault is that? And I never got anywhere because you blew me so full of hot air, I could never stand taking orders from anybody. That's whose fault it is. I hear that. Last time you heard that. I had to be boss big shot in two weeks and I'm through it. And hang yourself. For spite, hang yourself. No, nobody's hanging himself, Willie. I ran down 11 flights a day with a pen in my hand, you hear me? And suddenly I stopped. I stopped right in the middle of that office building and I saw the sky. I saw the things I love in this world. The work and the food and the time to sit down and smoke. And I looked at the pen in my hand and I said, what the hell am I grabbing? Why am I trying to be something I don't want to be? What am I doing in an office building? Making a contemptuous begging fool out of myself. When all I want is out there waiting for me, the minute I say I know who I am. Arthur Kennedy as Biff and Thomas Mitchell as Willie in Death of a Salesman. But which did Brendan Gill consider to be the most exciting period in the history of the American theatre? Well, I think you'd be a bitterly disappointed man if I were to tell you that I thought it was the period between 1841 and 1843 and a half. Uh, the answer is, of course, that I think today is the most successful and wide-ranging period that we've ever had in American drama. And it's in part because we have such a diversity at present was unknown uh, even 20 years ago in America, in part because of the immense increment of the black uh, playwrights upon American theater. There are 20 young black playwrights, both men and women, uh, any one of whom, Ed Bullens, Derek Wilcox, uh, Joseph Walker, who wrote The River Niger, all those playwrights are engaged in changing the course of American drama before my very eyes. So, of course, are uh, Sam Shepard, uh, so, of course, is, is Robert Wilson with his extraordinary plays, some of which last uh, 24 hours, some of which are, are intended to cover not a stage inside a proscenium, but a whole countryside. But uh, nobody is leading a flock of people in a given direction. Everybody is striking out on his own. Everybody is uttering uh, what Allen Ginsberg called all those years ago his howl. And I think the fruitfulness of the universal howl that is coming up from these hundreds of young playwrights uh, in America is bound to be heard all around the world. Brendan Gill with some optimistic thoughts on the state of contemporary American drama. To return to the novel, I said at the beginning of the program that we would be bound to exclude many famous names and books from our discussion. The great naturalistic vein in American fiction, the vein that fed such different talents as Theodore Dreiser, Sinclair Lewis and John Steinbeck, author of The Grapes of Wrath, is perhaps the most notable omission. Still, I think it's fair to say that their novels are probably not as popular now as they were once, although they have in common an immediacy which distinguishes the best of American fiction today. Tony Tanner. I think this emphasis on the okay. present is, is very important. It's, it goes again through all American writing and it's connected with the repudiation of Europe and history as, as some kind of vortex which America escaped from. So the elevation of the present tense as being of supreme importance is there from the beginning. And the only th the other tense that matters is the future. And let me just say one word in passing here about why Southern literature is, is so different from the other regional literatures in America is because they, in fact, not only have a past, but they tend not to be able to escape from it. It's, it's a past which has both the guilt, not only of the eradication of the Indians, but there the, the blacks are, that became the American problem. They also have the shame of defeat. It's the only part of America that suffered, as it were, defeat on its own land. So in a southern writing is quite different and there's an almost uh, obsessive, nightmare, exaggerated sense of the past as being some imprisoning weight or constriction from which characters struggle to emerge but fail to. It's
it's not a kind of um, source of enriching precedent or wisdom. It simply is like a, a sort of mouldy, rotting house which people can't escape from. And, and in Faulkner, for instance, uh, as often as not, the only escape is suicide. And there, that's why Southern literature is so interestingly different. It's that they can't get into the present because the past is still trapping them. He would seem to listen to two separate Quentins now. The Quentin Compson preparing for Harvard in the South, the Deep South, dead since 1865, and peopled with garrulous, outraged, baffled ghosts, listening, having to listen, to one of the ghosts which had refused to lie still even longer than most had, telling him about old ghost times, and the Quentin Compson who was still too young to deserve yet to be a ghost, but nevertheless having to be one for all that, since he was born and bred in the deep south the same as she was, the two separate Quentins now talking to one another, in the long silence of not people, in not language. A passage from Absalom, Absalom by William Faulkner, which I'm tempted to say was written in not prose, it's a typical work, heady with atmosphere and a sense of imminent doom. I've always been struck by the poetic quality of the Southern writers, such as Carson McCullers, and I wondered why their books and plays have such an appeal for European readers. The most obvious comment that comes to mind is that these works uh, contain a recognition of failure, tragedy, plans going awry, and the kind of thing which is more congenial to Europe. It seemed a more European type of, of, of sensibility, and also the kind of the ambiguity about social uh, structures, that from the one point of view, uh, there had been a social hierarchy in the South. It seemed in some ways to provide a sort of hierarchy of values, of social mores, of manners. On the other hand, realizing that in fact, this hierarchy sanctioned a great deal of cruelty and was based on exploitation of the blacks in, in, in their case, but we have a sense of exploitation of the working classes in Europe. So in that sense, their, their sense of the complexities and problems and ambiguities of being brought up in essentially a, a sort of um, a guilty society uh, meant that I think that uh, Europeans found more depth there than in some of the more, let's say, optimistic, rhapsodic, celebratory American writing, which simply emphasized all the good things and the good possibilities. How do you think American writers at the present time are coping? Twenty years ago, it was a sort of common view that the best writing, the best fiction was coming from America. That isn't quite such a common view now. Would you still go along with that? I think we may disagree about this. My, mm -hmm. my sense is, is that the experimental spectrum is now much broader than uh, it used to be. I'm, uh, I'm fascinated by what is going on in France, what is going on in Germany, the Nouveau Roman, the attempts uh, in Germany at another kind of new historiographical novel, as well as what is going on in the States. And I see now a, a I suppose, a postmodern spectrum, an international spectrum. And I think we're back in one of those eras of international experimentalism, such as we had at the beginning of this century, when modernism was the, the movement that was going on. And I wouldn't place America in, you know, in, in that sort of staple position yeah. that I once would. But apart from that, I do think American writing <laughs> is filled with fascination. is very, very important. I do think the American writers are still actually at the edge. There's, there's much less sort of mediation and protection from the erosion of supporting fictions than I think we still get in, in Europe and in England. Tony Tanner and Malcolm Bradbury. The excerpts were read by Bruce Myers. That's all from Kaleidoscope for tonight. We'll be back on the air at the usual time on Monday evening.